On April 13, 1970, Apollo 13 experienced an explosion in the oxygen tank in its service module, leading to a life-threatening situation that almost prevented the crew from returning home safely. Only a combination of failures could have caused such a situation, and in this case, the most critical events happened on the ground well before launch. The heater and the thermostat in the tank were originally designed for the command module's 28 volts, but were supposed to be upgraded to the 65 volt ground supply, but the tank subcontractor didn't do that. While connected to the 65 volt supply during a test, the tank overheated to 540 degrees Celsius, but the temperature sensor that was inside the tank was not designed to read anything higher than 27 degrees Celsius because the tank is supposed to be a cryogenic tank and so it's actually set to a very very low temperature normally. So no one knew the real temperature inside the tank. That high temperature melted the insulation on the power supply wires for the tank's fans. So what you've got is a bunch of exposed wires, uh, flammable insulation material, and a whole lot of oxygen. And so basically what you have is bomb. Really, what, what's going to happen is once they activate the tank fans, electricity is going to ignite the Teflon insulation. And then once that goes, then the oxygen is going to start heating up, boiling, and building up pressure. And uh, basically you got a little fire going in the tank. And you've got a pressure bomb. The tank will just rip apart. So the most dangerous thing you can do in this situation is activate those tank fans which would send the electricity through those wires. So this little exchange, uh, just four and a half hours before the accident, should give us a little bit of a pause. Go ahead. Uh, Roger, 13. Uh, because of the uh, O2 tank 2 quantity sensor uh, dropout, uh, uh, ECOM wants to keep a little closer track of the, uh, of the cryo quantities, and he's going to be asking you to stir all the cryo tanks at slightly more frequent intervals than uh, than have been planned. And the first time is now, and we'll be calling you probably every five or six hours, except during sleep periods and, uh, and high activity periods. We'd like you to do it now, over. Okay, we'll uh, start a cryo stir now. Thank you. So because they couldn't read the quantity in oxygen tank 2, they were going to run up the fans in order to stir up the tank, and of course it is oxygen tank 2 that is going to explode. But surely there should have been a warning light to tell the crew that pressure was building in this tank, right, before it actually exploded. Um, well, oxygen is paired with hydrogen to create electricity in the service module fuel cells, and three and a half hours before the accident, this exchange occurred. Jim, uh, just a uh, advisory. Uh, expect a caution and warning on H2 tank one. Pretty quick. Uh, no problem. Just warning you about it. Okay, crew pressure line on H2 uh, tank one uh, coming on shortly. Huh? Right. Okay. Well, you're pretty close. Any other predictions you'd like? Well, there's, uh, I guess there's all sorts. Did you go to the horse races with me? I'm sorry, you were garbled. Say again. I said I'd like to invite you to the horse races with me. Right. We'll, uh, we'll send ECOM. That was Vance Brand uh, with a caution and warning light advisory, timed almost to the second. Jim Lovell responded from the spacecraft. Uh, we're at 52 hours and nine minutes now into the flight and show Apollo 13 at 170,831 nautical miles above the Earth. Gene Kranz uh, just spoke to the ECOM and said, uh, that's pretty lucky. And then he said, oh, correction, that's pretty skillful. Well, if Ecom was uh, getting cocky at that point, uh, that was about to end real soon. But basically they were ignoring the pressure warning light for the cryotanks because they knew that there was an issue with the hydrogen one, which was basically reading zero, not realizing that there was a dangerous situation on the oxygen side. An hour before the accident, the crew started doing a TV spot at the 55-hour mark into the mission, so uh, 
two days and seven hours in, and they only concluded the broadcast six minutes before the accident. Here's a little taste of that broadcast. Your TV operator is now resting on the center couch, looking at uh, Fred Hayes, whose head is now just about the beginning of the tunnel, and his back is against the So a little bit of fun there before things get really serious. And of course the part where they use their view scope to look at the service module is particularly poignant because of course that's what they're going to have trouble with in a few moments. But that view really didn't give a proper picture of the location that will cause all the problems. Mission Control put the astronauts right back to work when the broadcast ended at 55 hours and 47 minutes into flight as they were observing the Comet Bennett and had other technical work to do. Apollo 13 Houston, the next thing we'd like you to do is to... Uh, go ahead. We'd like you to roll right to 060 and all your rates for photography of the Comet Bennett. To do that, we'd like you to enable quad C and D for the maneuver. Use all your quads. And in precisely one minute, we'd like you to terminate the battery charge on battery B. Okay, Jack, the battery charge has been terminated on the battery B. Roger, we see it, Jack. And uh, we got a reading of uh, 
minus two degrees on the docking uh, index. We'd like to uh, know if that's 2.0 precise or if it's 2.1 or 1.9. Now it's a minus 2.0 precisely. Thank you. And those are the kinds of things astronauts have to do on their missions. But there was one last bit of business before mission control let them relax. 13, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like you to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. In addition, uh, I have a shaft and trunnion. Okay. Or look at the comet Bennett if you need it. Okay. Stand by. Okay, yes, uh, sir, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main B bus undervolt. Roger, main B undervolt. So in one of their electrical systems, they're losing the sufficient voltage needed to run their electronic equipment, meaning that they're basically losing electric charge flow here. Uh, let's tune back in. Okay, stand by 13. We're looking at it. Okay, uh, right now, uh, Houston, the uh, voltage is, um, is looking good. Um, and we had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning there. And as I recall, BB was the one that uh, had a amp spike on it uh, once before. Roger, Fred. And the interim here, uh, we're starting to uh, go ahead and button up the tunnel again. Roger. Yeah, that, that jolt uh, must have rocked uh, uh, the sensor. Uh, on uh, C now in O2, uh, quantity 2, it uh, was oscillating uh, down around 20 to 60 percent. Now it's full scale high again. Roger. And uh, Houston, we had a restart on our computer. We have pink light and, uh, and the restart reset. Roger, restart. And a ping slice. Restart on a ping. Okay. And, uh, and I'm looking at our S service module RCS uh, UM1. We have uh, B as barber pole and D as barber pole. Helium 2, D as barber pole. And uh, secondary propellant, so I have uh, A and uh, B barber pole. TMAC temperatures. Okay, AC2 is showing zip. I'm trying to reconfigure on that, Jack. Roger. Yeah, we got a uh, main bus A undervolt now, too, Sean. Main A undervolt. It's reading about 25 and a half. B is reading zip right now. 13 Houston, we'd like you to attempt to reconnect fuel cell 1 to main A and fuel cell 3 to main B. Verify that quad delta is open. Okay, uh, Houston, I'm showing. I tried to reset and uh, fuel cell 1 and 3 both showing uh, gray flag, but they're both showing zip on the flows. We copy. Thirteen Houston, uh, we'd like you to verify a couple readings for us. Uh, we'd like the nitrogen pressure on fuel cell one. We need the oxygen pressure on fuel cell two. 
Okay, nitrogen on one and oxygen on two, is that correct? Negative oxygen on three. Okay. Okay, system test uh, 1A. Set zip. and uh, say again the other one. Uh, fuel cell one, uh, nitrogen uh, reads uh, zero. Roger, zero. 13 Houston, we'd like you to open circuit fuel cell one. Leave two and three as is. Okay, I'll get to work on that. And uh, Jack, uh, our O2 uh, quantity number two tank, is reading zero, did you get that? O2 quantity number two is zero. That's AC, okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good AC. And it looks to me, looking out the uh, hatch, that we are venting something. We are uh, we are venting something out uh, into the uh, into space. Roger, we copy your venting. It's a gas of some sort. In summary, they've lost most of the command module's power and life support systems, that's what all the zips were about, and are venting something into space. Oxygen Tank 2 is significantly reading zero, and they have lost a lot of power, which means that the instrumentation, but also the air circulation and temperature regulation inside the command module is not going to be functional for very long. Without some sort of heating, the crew could freeze, and it did end up getting close to the freezing point at times during this trip. Perhaps more importantly, they needed to conserve the command module systems as much as possible because it was their only ticket to re-entry. So the first order of business was shutting it down and switching to the LEM, the lunar module. That was a new procedure that the people on the ground, particularly the ECOMs, Asai Sibrigo and John Aaron, had to devise so that the command module could eventually be turned back on again. It was never meant to be shut down during operation in space. So this all had to be new procedures and of course these are very complicated systems and they have to make sure that they turn them off and on in the right order. The decision to go around the moon in order to get back home was an obvious one actually. Apollo 13 was very long past the halfway point on the trip and it was too risky to light the service module engine since uh, that possibly could have been damaged by the oxygen tank exploding it was right next to the oxygen tank, and the service module engine had most of their fuel. Uh, it's possible that they could have risked lighting that engine, but in that case they would have had to dump the lunar module, or otherwise they could have kept the lunar module, burned the engine, and then used the lunar module engine but dumped the service module. In that case though, their heat shield would be exposed to space and all sorts of micrometeorites and all that, and their heat shield could get damaged, so they needed to keep the service module just to shield their their heat shield. So they ended up going around the moon. That meant making minor adjustments using the lunar module descent engine, which thankfully also had quite a bit of fuel, not to mention throttling capability. The spacecraft Apollo 13 was initially on a low pass over the moon, not on a free return trajectory at this point because they did the mid-course correction to make sure that they were going low over the moon. So now they had to readjust to a higher approach and that would end up putting them at a lower approach on the earth end. And so that would be the free return trajectory. This higher approach means that Apollo 13 holds the record for the farthest away from Earth that humans have traveled to date. Now, in the simulation, I actually ended up in a much higher approach than they did because my initial trajectory wasn't very NASA. And I had to do a lot more burning with the LEM descent engine than they did. But I ended up with plenty of fuel margin despite my horrible trajectory. So it was a safe thing to do. It wasn't immediately recognized that carbon dioxide would be a problem for the astronauts. CO2 is scrubbed out of the air using lithium hydroxide filters, and the filter in the LEM was only meant for two people, not three. The command module was powered down and couldn't suck air to process it, so the people on the ground had to come up with a makeshift way to get the command module uh, 
filters containers with the lithium hydroxide to work with the lens systems. It was literally a case of fitting square pegs into round slots because the c command module cans were cubes while the lens were cylinders. The command module was manufactured by North American while the lunar module was built by Grumman. So they were actually manufactured by two different companies, that's why. On the trip back, it was largely a matter of keeping up morale among the crew. The astronauts were very cold and mostly spent their time in the dark unless the sun was shining through the window. Uh, there was certainly no power for TV broadcasts and they had to conserve their energy as much as possible because uh, they were lacking in water, they were conserving water. Given all that, it's interesting to hear how they kept up their spirits and maintained their focus, of course, because they had a lot of work to do to prepare for re-entry, not including all the stuff they had to do just to survive, including adjusting the carbon dioxide filters. Uh, one thing that occurred close to re-entry, once they were back on the Earth side, was how to separate the LEM, the lunar module, from the command module before re-entry. Because the lunar module is never supposed to leave the vicinity of the moon. They've carried it all the way back to the Earth, and now they have to release the service module first, but it was the one that had the balanced RCS, the reaction control system that allows maneuvering. The command module RCS is only meant to maintain attitude through re-entry. It doesn't make uh, translational maneuvers. It can't move back and forth like that. Uh, the service module was blown though, so there was no way to use it. Obviously, as with everything, it came down to a team of engineers who decided to pressurize the tunnel between the command module and the lunar module so that the pressure would push the lunar module away. Unfortunately, in the simulation, I did not have that option. There is a lot more that could be said about this mission and how the crew did during their ordeal. Hours and hours worth of tapes about what they did in order to survive. At least one major motion picture has been made about such things and that was still a tip of the iceberg affair. For now, I'll leave you with the single most important fact. They made it back. I hereby declare that this was a successful mission. From the start, the exploration of space has been hazardous adventure. The voyage of Apollo 13 dramatized its risks. The men of Apollo 13, by their poise and skill, under the most intense kind of pressure, epitomize the character that accepts danger and surmounts it. Thank you for watching this presentation of Today in Space History for April 13th, the accident on Apollo 13 and its return. Special thanks to Frizank for the Apollo spacecraft model used in this video. And with that, see you next time.